That's the journey. And in that journey, one of the ways, uh, when I was talking to you, uh, you said, is to lead by example. Because you are quite happy just washing the cars yourself. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So how do you espouse that culture in people uh, like Ali, for example, and your other general managers that, you know, pick up the cloth, get the sponge, start washing? One lesson to all my general managers, never ask somebody to do a job you can't do. And prove it to that person that you can do it better. I do not know whether you, but there was a story in the old days, there was a guy who came uh, who, into our showroom. We used to I, wash cars and deliver it to a customer if, there was it, if that was the thing that was to be done. In the old workshop in Rashidia, I was cleaning a car because there was a lady, I remember there was a lady who, and she was such a fussy customer. It was unbelievable. <laughs> so we, you know, we had to get the car done to give it to her. We had given her a particular time. At that time, the washing machine broke. Whatever could go wrong, went wrong. Somebody else was passing by and then, you know, a few days later, you know, he asked somebody, he said, you know, I met this guy, you know, he works now. What does he do in Alnabudha? So they told him he's the chief executive of the company. He said, what? He was washing cars yesterday. But because of that, all my managers got into the same work ethos. Mm -hmm. You know, they worked along with me. We have worked nights, we have worked days. Okay, today I'm fortunate I don't have to do it. These young people do it for me. But you earned that position by, I by building that example. 18 hours a day. I lived opposite, my house was opposite. I never even used a car, I used to walk across. Right. Uh, and my wife would call me at 8.30, 9 in the night saying, hello, you know, there's a house across the road, you know, you've got to come back. <laughs> and she was regretting the encouragement she gave you well, to uh, the job. <laughs> and uh, we, don't, we don't need to do it now, thank God. Right. But uh, those were the days you had to do it. And we did it. And it's a matter of pride when you, you know, when you build something and you walk in and see it in front of you for the first time. Right. Now, in every business, uh, let's just build a context of the business. How many cars are sold in, uh, in the luxury segment, BMW, uh, Audi, uh, sorry, okay. yours and uh, Mercedes? I would tell you, in the what luxury... What market share do you have? Because we're okay. celebrating you see, how much you've done, but... If it's only 5%, who cares? No, no. It's, it's a very small, in terms of market, because the Japanese are there, my giants. No, no, I'm talking about the luxury cars. Luxury, yeah. luxury, yeah. Big, with our three brands, we would control about 35-40% of the market. Okay. I'm larger than BMW and Mercedes put together. Wow. Okay. How do you do that? Because they're great cars. They're both German. They're all good so, cars. So the differentiating factor is, is very little and, and a lot of them, like the Mercedes, for example, Let me give you an a, interesting has statistic. a legacy. 70% uh, yeah. of my customers are repeat customers. So that's your secret? That's my secret. They come back and buy a car from me, the second car, the third car, the fourth car. They might move from one of my brands to another. They might buy, an Audi guy might move into a Porsche or an a Volkswagen guy might move into an Audi but they will stick to Al Nabudha. What's that secret source in terms of loyalty? Give the customer what he wants. Look after him. Okay, but that's not so secret. Everybody can do that. No, but you're going to do it well. Everybody can say I'm doing it, but you've got to do it well. So, and so what's your it. training programs do you have? What's we have huge training programs and I think they'll agree with me that if we ever lose a sale, I still lose my temper. <laughs> okay. Because, because you okay. care, because... Yeah, because, you know, yeah. when a customer leaves your showroom and he goes without buying a car, yeah. you're dead. Yeah. Because he has walked into a competitor showroom and it's gone. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. Sometimes it's price sensitive, okay? You can do that much in the luxury segment. So, so the secret, uh, again, I, and I'm, I'm really conscious about this because we work in a, in, in a lot of very competitive businesses, whether it's hotels or cars or luxury products and so on, that, that little differentiator, is it service? Is it people? Is it... Uh, Combination. People giving good service is very important. Have you noticed that in Dubai, the standard of service is really third rate in most places? Sadly, yes. No? Okay. Yes. This is what I tell my staff. When a guy walks into the showroom, yeah. make him feel different. Let him not feel, oh, this is again the Dubai service. Eh? Okay, he'll say, I'll call tomorrow and he won't call. That doesn't work. Now, let's, every company has a tipping point. Uh, 
what, at what stage of 50 cars a month to 100 cars a month to 1,000 cars a month, at what stage did you feel you went over that inflection point so that you can then really, really grow? Because building scale is, is a very tough task. What were the things you were looking no, at? No, we needed to build infrastructure first. Right. You know? Out of that small shed in Rashidia, if we wanted to go into 7,000, 5,000 cars, it was not going to work. Out of that small showroom in Garud, it was not going to work. So now you were left with a dilemma. What comes first, the chicken or the egg? Do you put in money and wait for your returns? Or you turn around and say, let me try to put the cars on the road and generate some money too. But we bit the bullet. I spoke to Khalifa. We built the, the huge showroom of Volkswagen on Sheikh Zayed Road and we built the Volkswagen service center. That was the turning point of the company because then we had the infrastructure to deliver what the customer wanted. I think what we'll do is, is uh, uh, so, uh, engage some questions from the audience about uh, the, the, the time at, uh, at Al Nabuda in Audi because then we can move to the next stage of his life and move to his family and the future. So uh, at this sort of halfway point, uh, can we engage some questions, please? If there, do we want to ask, I mean, does anyone want to ask a question uh, to Mr. Rajaram? Thank you very much. Your name and... Uh, uh, my name's Simon, it's a pleasure and really enjoying the evening. There's no, no shortcut to success. I just managed, uh, wondered how you managed your frustrations. Thank you. At through through I, those difficult I, I, I have a wall which is fairly beaten with my head. <laughs> How do you manage frustrations? Uh, I think I have a wife and son there who have also taken a good brunt of it. Sometimes you've got to let go. You know, uh, it's, uh, uh, the people around me will tell you that you, know, you reach a flash point when you really get angry. But as long as you take it out on the people around you, but you're fair at every time, people forgive you for it. But you have to flash. And let me be honest with you, I'm not going to sit here and lie and say that I'm calm and collected. I'm not. I rarely fly off the handle when things go wrong. Next question. Ask you for what is your vision? What drives you? And where do you see yourself and your group five years from now? And how do you plan to achieve it? Okay. There's a very simple answer. I told Khalifa we were sitting down one day. He said, where will we go from now? We are the world's largest Porsche dealer. We control 40% of Audi Volkswagen sales in the region. We have the world's largest Audi showroom. Where do we go from now? I told him, now we build a legacy. You and I don't need the money anymore. But we now leave behind a stamp and say that, hey, these guys, the Nabuda family and Rajaram, did something for the automobile industry, which changed it. Where do I see my company five years from today? I see my company growing in size, of course, which is a normal corollary of where we are going now. But more of than not, we want to be known as a company that cares. A company that cares for its people who work for it and a company which gives back to its community. That is our vision for the future. Good evening, sir. Good uh, evening. Anirudh Dastidhar, my name. I'm also from the automotive industry. Oh, okay. And uh, first time I heard of you, uh, I was, I'm an ex-South uh, Bhavan. Oh, okay. Uh, You're, so you know me from my Oman days. Yes. Uh, okay. But uh, by the time I reached Oman and started working for South Bhavan, uh, you were already packing your bags in Oman and you were in Dubai. Oh, okay. But uh, Rajaram, even in Oman was a big name. Your question, Thank you. sir? I remember. So what do you see, like, uh, before the recession, like, uh, automotive industry in general, I'm not talking about any particular brand. Uh, <clears throat> we, all brands in general, had achieved huge numbers, which I feel still we have not able to come back to where we were before the recession, before the global meltdown started. So what do you see the future, especially this particular region, Middle East? Uh, 
or me? I have, I don't know what brand you represent, but I must correct you and at the cost of sounding arrogant, we had a very small dip in the recession for our brands. And today, we outsell what we did before the recession. That's fantastic. So, I, I don't know, I, I don't know how to answer your question. But I did hear that my Japanese friends are suffering from that problem of not getting to those numbers. But I think there are far more richer people in Dubai now than they were before. I, I see no other reason, you know, because I sell premium brands. And uh, you know the old adage, the rich get richer. You got to give the customer a unique experience. And you have been to my Audi showroom. Absolutely. It's been. something totally different. Yeah. You know, and when a come guy is walking in to pay, to spend 200 to 300,000 dirhams of his money, he doesn't want to be treated like he's come to buy a bicycle. One of the things you said to me when I earlier spoke to you, that you, uh, the best way to talk about, uh, to market your product is your car on the road. On the road. And uh, is that philosophy shared by uh, other luxury car holders? Because to me, that's not a luxury strategy that's much, much more a, a general consumer strategy. There are many ways of putting the cars on the road, okay. But let me tell you, in automobile, in the automobile business, the money is at the back end, in the service and the that's repair of the car. Yes. You sell a car once, but he's your customer for the next five years. Yeah. You look after him in this five-year period, he comes back to you again and again to buy from you. Yeah. So it's a very short-sighted chief executive who will say, I don't care what it is, but let me make a killing now. And in that process, maybe even lose the customer. Yeah. But I wouldn't like to do that. So, so and when we started off, I, I'll tell you, we sold cars at zero margin. Because we just wanted them on the road. Right. And you made money on the service coming. We through. made money on the... Okay, it comes two and years later. And then build, later. The, build yeah. the brand and, and, and position it. Let me give you another statistic. Okay. Out of every 100 cars you put on the road, 20 goes into the body shop in a two-year period. That's bad driving. <laughs> okay. Now, l l let me just visualize something which is a little bit different. And that is that... Uh, let's project ourselves 10, 20 years forward. Uh, cars are not green and you're really pumping it out there with all these gas guzzling machines, so you're very, very carbon unfriendly. Yeah. Do you, how well do you sleep at nights that you're killing this, 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 this planet? I'll be dead and gone by then, but <laughs> and let me answer <laughs> okay. your question. Yeah. All yeah. my brands have hybrids available. Right. Uh, we are trying to promote the car, but let me tell you something. There's also a lot of hoopla about this hybrid thing. Do you know how much it costs to generate a kilowatt of electricity? You know, hybrid, everybody talks about hybrid and it is the savior of the future. The Americans calculated that if there was a street full of completely electrical cars, the power consumption would far outweigh the carbon menace. Interesting. I've never heard that one, but very interesting. So, Yep. People are now rethinking it. You know, they're saying, you know, where are we headed with this hybrid thing? Okay, hybrid technology will come. It's good technology. They've experimented with hydrogen vehicles. They've experimented with various types of technology. But I don't think we have hit the ultimate answer yet. Let me throw another challenge at you. I, I think uh, a lot of people will be surprised at what I'm about to come up with. I read a very interesting article uh, about a month ago, where your future competitor in 10 years' time is unlikely to be Mercedes or BMW, is much, much more likely to be Google. Google, Google with their driverless cars, yeah. is actually, uh, there's an expectation that in 10 years' time, Google will make more money on driverless cars than they will make on search. Very interesting statistic. Yeah, but that It'll Google's driverless car is a Volkswagen. Hello. There you go. No. So I was going to say, so, <laughs> so the whole service concept will yeah. change. And I, I'm getting to the point that uh, the, the paradigms change, business models change. Uh, and you have to change with times. Yeah. You know, if you see the shift coming, yeah. what is the difference between a good chief executive and a bad chief executive? Somebody who can see Adapt. the future coming yeah. Yeah. at him. We knew a very long time ago that we needed to up 
our top of the range cars because this is where the market was headed. We concentrated on it. That is why we have such a huge Q7 A8 segment in the Audi today. Right. In the old days, we concentrated on the A4 and the A6 because we thought that was the most sellable car. Right. Good. Any more questions before we get on to the next level? Thank you very much. My name is Georgina Kelly. Um, the question I have is, do you have a profile of the kind of people that actually buy your luxury and cars? Do you work on a profile base or how do you do it? We do. We record every customer who comes into our showroom whether he purchases a car or not. We have a computer system which is called eGood Manners. The entire details of the customer are fed into the computer until the salesman has to record, I have lost the sale or he has to say, I have sold the car. And when this is done, the computer has got a complete profile of his nationality, where he comes from, is he a first time buyer? Has he purchased cars before? And I, or based on that, I'll give you an interesting statistic. F uh, quite a few of our customers we are now finding are first-time buyers in Dubai. These are the new people who are coming in. Because like I told you, our core was our repeat customers. And now we are finding more and more new customers. And these are first-time buyers in Dubai. So that is where the market base is growing. For the young, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, for the young entrepreneurs here, what is your advice? And there are a lot of SMEs, people who are aspiring to the kinds of things that you're doing. You did it in a, in a corporate entrepreneurial environment. They might be doing it in their own environment. What is that secret from your wisdom and from your learning that you, what you'd like to share? What do they need to do to make it happen for them? Hard work, and I must say there is also an element of luck involved, ladies and gentlemen, because unless there's a hand of God or whatever they say over your head, you need a modicum and element of that because uh, you can be extremely hardworking, you could be intelligent, but if you're plain unlucky, it's not going to work for you. I have been fortunate and I've been fortunate that I've been surrounded by good people and I'm fortunate that I'm surrounded by a good team and I'm also very fortunate I came to Dubai in the year I did because that is exactly when Dubai started taking off. So being at the right place at the right time. So you make your own luck. My you, father gave me this advice once. He said, you know, the harder that you work, the luckier you get. So uh, because yeah. that's one of the things that exactly. I have worked on. And because when people like ask me, how do you make luck? And you know, we give technical answers like it's a cross between opportunity and preparation and all no, of those no, kinds no. of things. <laughs> but it's hard work. Hard work. Great. All right, sir. Let's moving on to the next level, next stage of uh, uh, Raj's life. Uh, on a more human side, sir. Um, what were the low moments in your life? Because I know you had a, a tragedy earlier on in yeah. your on your life. And how did that affect you? Would you like to share that with us, sir, please? Uh, my first wife, uh, my son's natural mother, died when he was, I think, uh, eight or ten years old. And uh, it shook all of us because my wife was a very young lady I mean, at that time. And uh, I was left alone with my son. Uh, and you know how the environment is in the Middle East. You know, you're surrounded by nannies and servants. I was a spoiled brat myself. And here was a young man growing up to even, you know, defy his father. And I think one of the worst decisions I had to take at that time was if I had to put him or give him a sense of purpose in life and change the way he was being brought up because his entire life being consisted, uh, consisted of being looked after by cooks and nannies and drivers who were just doing his bidding. There was nobody disciplining him. I was away at work 